What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're gonna be talking about febrile seizures. But before we get started, it is extremely important that if you guys wanna to continue to support us, because if you guys like this video, if you benefit from it, please continue to support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and most importantly, subscribing. All right, let's get into it. All right, so let's talk about the etiology and pathophysiology of febrile seizures. Now, when we talk about these, it's obviously a fever that is the trigger for the seizures, right? But what is causing that fever is the question. And that's what's very important. So it's primarily viral infection. So it's primarily a viral infection that's a trigger. What are the viral infections that you need to be thinking about? The first one that I want you to be thinking about here is H. HV, human herpes virus, and particularly six. You see this in a condition called roseola infantum, where they have a fever and they have this viral exanthem, a rash all over the place, and they have febrile seizures as a potential complication. The other one is H1 N1, which is your influenza type of virus, right? And then the third thing is actually not as common, but it can occur if you have some type of viral infection or if there was a recent vaccination. And the particular one is the MMR vaccine or the DTaP vaccine. So the measles, mumps, rubella, or the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis toxin uh, vaccines. So these are particular triggers when exposed to these types of things, whether it be the virus or an attenuated form like a vaccine, you can develop this kind of immunological reaction leading to a fever and then seizures can actually develop. Now, not only is there an environmental component, but there may be a genetic involvement as well. Particularly, we tend to see these types of seizures in two particular things. This is extremely important, don't forget this. We see this in a very particular age range, six months, to five years of age tends to be the most common age range where we see febrile seizures actually occurring. And what's even more interesting is that we tend to see this in someone who has a child who had a family history, maybe one of their first degree relatives, a father, a mother, had a history of febrile seizures, there is a high likelihood that they will also develop febrile seizures. So again, quickly recap, viral infection, HHV6, roseola infantum, please don't forget that, influenza, vaccines like MMR DTaP, and again, six months to five years of age with a family history, first degree relative who's had that. Now, how do these things particularly lead to febrile seizures is the question, right? We should be asking that. We're ninja nerds, we think about these things. So let's say that we're exposed to this actual virus, whatever this actual pathogen in this case is, where, whether it be the pathogen or whether it be the vaccine. When our immune system is exposed to this, right? You know macrophages, they'll come, they'll engulf the pathogen. They'll take, once they engulf the pathogen, they'll express a piece of that type of pathogen on their actual MHC2 complexes, right? And once they express this on their MHC2 complexes, they'll present that to T cells. And then your T cells, particularly your T helper cells, they'll interact with that antigen via their T cell receptor, and then they'll interact with the MHC2 complex via the CD4 positive proteins. Once this interaction occurs, it triggers a cytokine type of release. Now, these cytokines that are released include which ones? You guys are gonna be so good at this. You guys will be able to see these cytokines in your sleep. Interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha tend to be the most prominent cytokines that are released. Now, when these cytokines are released, they do a couple things. One of the really interesting ones that I actually find the most interesting is that these tend to have the ability to act on very specific types of receptors present on neurons. These receptors, they tend to hyperactivate or increase the sensitivity of these receptors. What are these little red proteins here called? These are called, let's, br let's bring these up here. These are called NMDA receptors. You're like, what that mean, man? Don't worry, daddy got you. So you know there's particular types of neurons called glutaminergic neurons. These guys release glutamate. And when glutamate is released, it acts on these NMDA receptors, stimulating them, right? And when it stimulates these, generally, you'll have cations that'll flow into this cell. When the cations load into this neuron, what does it do to the inside of the neuron? It makes it super positive. When you increase the positive charge within the cell enough that it hits threshold potential, that can increase your 
depolarization. So then you depolarize the cell. Then if you depolarize it, you trigger these things called action potentials to move down the axon. And this can lead to increased action potentials, represented as EPs. These increased action potentials, if they're excessive, if they're synchronous, this can lead to seizure activity. Man, we good. So what happens is these cytokines during the fever in this population tend to increase the sensitivity of this NMDA receptor. So every time glutamate binds, more cations flow in, more depolarization occurs, more action potentials and seizures arise. Okay, what else can happen? Because man, we're, we're on a roll here. Well, you know, what was the thing that we said? There has to be a fever, right? Well, these things happen, but guess what? These chemicals here also act on a very particular structure located within our central nervous system, sitting right here. Let's actually draw this one here in a blue color. Nice, beautiful color here. Look at this. Mmm, that look good. That's our hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is kind of like our, it has a lot of different functions, but one of them in this role is that it plays a role in kind of regulating or modulating our body temperature. When the hypothalamus is stimulated by these cytokines, it triggers the release of a very particular molecule called PGE2 that then will stimulate other parts of the hypothalamus to eventually increase, working through different regulatory mechanisms, increase our body's temperature. When you increase the body temperature, that obviously is going to lead to a fever, right? So that obviously that can lead to a fever. Now the problem with this is, is that fever is going to increase your basal metabolic rate. It's going to increase the metabolism and a lot of the activity of different cells within the body. What do you think one of those cells are that's going to become a little bit more hyperactive, a little bit more stimulated, and it can then increase depolarization, increase action potentials, and potentially lead to seizures? Man, we good. So fevers potentially seem to work in that particular way. Now, another thing that happens is that fevers, you know what else they tend to do? Let's think really smart here. Fevers particularly increase your basal metabolic rate. So let's actually go back to this. They increase your basal metabolic rate. What does that mean? That means that you utilize more oxygen, right? So you're gonna increase oxygen utilization. And so because of that, you're gonna consume more oxygen. So if you increase your consumption of oxygen, you're going to need to bring more oxygen into the body to compensate for that consumption because of this increased basal metabolic rate. So what do you do to bring more oxygen in? <laughs> I'm going to breathe faster and maybe even deeper. So if I increase the reaction to this, increase my respiratory rate, and I increase the depth of breathing, what am I going to do? I'm going to, in this process, I may bring more oxygen into the lungs if I'm breathing quicker and deeper, which will help to perfuse more oxygen into the blood. But at the same time, what is the other gas? You know, there's a particular type of relationship here that whenever oxygen moves across, another gas has to move across, and that is CO2. So with every type of oxygen is moving, there's also gonna be CO2 moving, and that CO2 is going to be exhaled. So as much of oxygen that we bring in, the amount of CO2 that we're breathing out. So if we increase the CO2 expiration, what happens to the CO2 levels in the blood as respect to that? You're gonna drop them CO2 levels, baby. And if you drop the CO2 levels, what is that formula? So what, let's, let's think about that formula with CO2. Let's make sense of this acid base type of problem if you see where I'm going here, right? So CO2 plus water. I know you guys know this formula. It leads to carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid can easily and quickly disassociate into protons and into bicarb. Now, think about Le Chatelier's principle. We have less of this CO2. If there's less CO2 on this side of the reaction, Le Chatelier's principle says that you have to shift the reaction to the side where there's less amount of substrate. And so we're going to shift the reaction this way. If I shift the reaction this way, what happens to the amount of protons that are going to be present within the body? Well, I'm using them to make CO2. So then the protons will drop, and this will cause my pH to go up because these are inverse. So this is a condition called respiratory alkalosis. Now here's the problem. Alkalosis is a trigger for seizures. So if that is the case and we cause this alkalosis type of effect, this respiratory alkalosis may lead to seizures as a result of this.
manly good. So what are the three things that I want you guys to take away from this within this pathophysiology? One is that these cytokines can increase the sensitivity of the NMDA receptors. Two, increasing the body's temperature leading to a fever increases the basal metabolic rate of neurons, increases the firing of them. And three, increasing the basal metabolic rate, which leads to more oxygen utilization. You have to breathe faster, deeper, you bring more oxygen in, but you get more CO2 out, leads to an alkalosis, and alkalosis is a trigger for seizures. Boom, roasted, let's move on to clinical features. All right, so now let's talk about the clinical features. We talked about the triggers, what can lead to these seizures. But now, whenever these children, six months to five years of age come in with seizures, how will they present? And how do I know if this is a complex febrile seizure or a simple febrile seizure? So simple febrile seizures, it seems paradoxical. But with simple febrile seizures, they tend to be more generalized. So they're gonna involve both cerebral hemispheres. So if you get both cerebral hemisphere involvement, you can develop these, first off, generalized seizures. So generalized, and what does that mean when I say generalized? It means you get more symmetrical involvement. And when I say symmetrical involvement, how do generalized seizures usually present with that classic case that you see, the tonic-clonic seizures? In simple febrile seizures, they present technically as a tonic clonic type of seizure. So a very big thing to remember there. So two things I want you to take away from this is it's a generalized seizure that usually leads to a symmetrical involvement, meaning you get upper and lower extremity involvement in a particular tonic clonic type of fashion. The next thing that I need you guys to remember is that the time frame is also very crucial. The duration of the seizure, it tends to be in simple less than 15 minutes in duration. It's usually no greater than 15 minutes in duration for the seizure. The other thing is, it's how frequent the seizures can occur. So if someone has, let's say, a simple febrile seizure that lasts less than 15 minutes, would they develop another seizure within a 24-hour period? No. It's usually one seizure in 20 four hours, no more than that. If there's greater than one seizure in a 24 hour period, it's not a simple febrile seizure, it's more likely a complex febrile seizure. So again, big things to take away, simple febrile, generalized tonic-clonic symmetrical movement, less than 15 minutes in duration, and you don't have more than one in a 24 hour period. Let's talk about complex febrile seizures. Complex febrile seizures tend to be, again, a little bit paradoxical here, tend to be more focal. So they usually have one type of hemispheric involvement, not bilateral. So this tends to be more of a focal type of seizure, and so you get more unilateral type of involvement. And again, this may present with a unilateral tonic type, so it may present with a unilateral tonic type, it may present as a clonic, it may present as a atonic, or it may present as a myoclonic type, okay? So these are big things to remember here. Now, when they have this focal, unilateral, abnormal type of movement that's present, because it's, again, usually one hemisphere, focal in nature, how long will these occur? Well, think about it, that was less than 15. What do you think this one is? greater than or equal to 15 minutes. So if the duration that these children are seizing and this focal type of seizure is greater than or equal to 15 minutes, it points to a complex febrile seizure. Or if they have greater than, greater than one, great, we can actually say greater than or equal to one, one seizure in 24 hours. That points to a complex febrile seizure. So again, simple febrile seizures, remember, it is generalized, tonic-clonic, symmetrical movement, okay? Complex febrile, it's focal, unilateral abnormal movements. Uh, simple febrile is less than 15 minutes in duration, and usually you don't have more than one in a 24-hour period. Complex febrile, greater than or equal to 15 minutes, and you have more than one in a 24-hour period. Last thing is that both of these can develop a post-ictal type of state. A post-ictal state, 
for these are usually no greater than, and this is extremely important, this usually lasts about five to 10 minutes. And usually we characterize this as kind of being drowsy, maybe even a little bit confused. So they're, this mental status is a little bit reduced. It's very important to remember the time frame. It usually doesn't go more than 10 minutes. If someone has drowsiness or confusion, the level of consciousness is declined for more than that period of time, you may want to be thinking about an alternative type of diagnosis, okay? So these are the big clinical features. Let's talk about diagnosis. So diagnosis, when we talk about Fibro seizures. The big thing is to take a look at your physical exam, their history. Did they recently have a viral infection like a week ago? Did they have any kind of vaccination about a week ago? Did they have any family history of fibro seizures? That's a quick thing within the history that we can think about. Physical exam findings that usually point more to an alternative diagnosis is something to quickly rule out. Is their level of consciousness significantly declined, but it's been declined for more than how long? Potentially 10 minutes. That points to alternative diagnosis, okay? So this is particularly maybe an alternative diagnosis. The other thing, do they have any other signs like meningeal signs? What are meningeal signs? Because that can also point to an alternative diagnosis. Do they have any neck stiffness? Do they have any headaches? Do they have any photophobia or phonophobia? Do they have the positive Koenigs or the Brzezinski's test? That could be pointing to an alternative sign. The other thing is, think about their vital signs. So did they have any abnormal vital signs? Was there any significant hypoxemia? Was there any hypotension? Are they having a fever? These are things that may point to maybe this could be a simple febrile seizure or a complex febrile seizure. And the last thing is look for any viral Exanthems, what does that mean? You know in someone who has roseola infantum, they have a lot of that rash all over their body, they have a fever, they have this rash and they can develop seizures. That may point to that. Or, you know, in someone who has um, Coxsackie virus, which can also be sometimes a cause, they may have herpetic lesions in the oral cavity. So again, look for any kinds of signs that may point to more of like a respiratory or some kind of viral exanthem or viral disease that may be related here. Once we've done that, we've gone through our physical exam, we really want to think about this. It's usually an infection that potentially could be the cause. And once we find the infected source, we may just have to like, you know, treat that. So what is the potential things that we can look for infectious sources in a patient? And the first one is, let's say that we want to make sure that there's no urinary tract infection, especially in children. If there is a urinary tract infection, how would we check that? Do a urinalysis, a UA, and then you can also do a urine culture. Boom, we just determined if there was a UTI potentially present, okay? The other thing is, what if there's some type of gastroenteritis of some kind? There's some type of GI tract infection. So maybe there's a GIT infection of some kind. What can I do here? We'll look for maybe any inflammation of the bowel walls. You don't want to get CT scans in children, so one of the best things to do is do ultrasound. So sometimes performing an abdominal ultrasound can be kind of a nice go-to test here. The other thing that we don't want to miss is, is there any infection like pneumonia or any kind of like viral pneumonia of some kind? I don't want to miss anything like that. How can I do that? Get a chest x-ray. So these are quick little things that I can do to try to find where is, if there is an infectious source, where is it? Let me rule out any really nasty ones because then I can address that issue. Once we have ruled out these things, the next step that you go to is you can start to have another kind of thing that you need to be thinking about. Simple febrile seizures don't usually like require a very thorough workup, to be honest with you. Uh, sometimes they won't even require this kind of workup. Complex febrile seizures generally require kind of a more kind of underlying evaluation for infection, be the things that we talked about. But a complex febrile seizure may also require some imaging, some even more invasive studies. So one of the quick things that we should do though is obtain some blood work. When I obtain some blood work, one of the things I like to look for is I like to look at the sodium, okay? The reason why is that if someone has low 
sodium, hyponatremia. There has been literature that suggests that this can trigger febrile seizures. The other thing I like to look at is I like to look at two things. I like to look at the glucose within the blood and maybe blood cultures. And the reason why is we're gonna talk about that right here. If you obtain glucose and you obtain blood cultures, you probably are gonna compare this to a lumbar puncture. Again, lumbar puncture, unless this is a complex febrile seizure or you suspect an alternative diagnosis like meningitis or encephalitis of some kind, then you should perform a lumbar puncture and run through these cultures, run through at the glucose level. You're gonna check the proteins. You're gonna do all of that stuff. You may even run a viral panel, the whole nine yards on this, just to make sure that you rule out any meningitis, rule out any encephalitis, or any other kinds of negative events here. When you do that, you generally like to take the lumbar puncture and compare like the glucose to the glucose in the blood. Generally, if it's a bacterial infection, glucose within this area will be lower and then it will be much, much lower compared to the serum glucose, okay? Also, blood cultures. Was there any infection that was in the actual blood and maybe it spread to the central nervous system comparing to that cultures there? Okay, so again, look for the infected source. UA, urine culture. We can do an ultrasound of the abdomen. We can do a chest x-ray. We can get checking glucose and blood cultures and using that to help with our assessment of the lumbar puncture, looking for hyponatremia. The last thing is what if we wanna rule out any structural lesions? What if there's some type of structural lesion here present? Well, then that's where a CT or an MRI can come in handy. And the last thing and probably one of the most important ones that you need to obtain in someone with a complex febrile seizure is an EEG an electroencephalogram to look to see if there's any electrographic representation of these seizures, okay? So that covers our diagnosis. So the last thing that I want us to talk about here is treatment. So we've gone through, we've figured out the potential triggers. We've talked about the clinical features. We've gone through our diagnostics. We've come to the point where we said, okay, this is a simple febrile seizure or a complex febrile seizure. Usually, these seizures will not require treatment. Usually, they'll abort on their own in about five minutes. But if this is greater than or equal to five minutes, or it's a complex type of febrile seizure, it's probably going to require some abortive therapies. What is the first line? They ask you on an exam, what is the first line thing for someone who has a febrile seizure? It's been seizing for more than five minutes or it is complex in nature. You say lorazepam. So giving them a particular type of benzodiazepine called lorazepam is your first line. Alternatives include midazolam. You can give this if you don't have any like IV access or diazepam. Okay, how do these drugs work? They're very simple. They're acting on GABA receptors. You know, on these actual neurons here, let's say that this is the neuron that's, you know, triggered here, and it's the one that's triggering a lot of these like action potentials and seizures. Well, if we shut down these seizures, what we can do is we can have this neuron, you know, it releases a molecule called GABA. So this is a GABA neuron. It releases lots of GABA. These drugs here, lorazepam, midazolam, and diazepam will act on particular sites on these GABA-A receptors and make these GABA-A receptors more sensitive. And so whenever GABA binds onto these actual receptors, they open up more intensely and allow for chloride ions to flow in to this actual neuron. That leads to lots of negative ions coming into the cell. Lots of negative ions lead to what? Hyperpolarization, it makes the cell super negative. If you hyperpolarize the cell, will you lead to action potentials? No, it's going to decrease the action potentials, APs, which may decrease the seizure. Man, we good. All right. The last thing that I want us to talk about here is if you've aborted the therapy, okay, you've, uh, you've given abortive therapy because they've seized for more than five minutes or a complex febrile seizure is present, 
The other thing is addressing the fever. Generally, these are viral infections. It's pr primarily a viral infection. That's why generally this diagnostic workup, this may be overboard. You may not have to perform a lot of these things. It may just be looking at the history and the physical exam. If it's complex fibrosis seizure, you may have to do this workup, or if you have an alternative diagnosis that you're thinking about, you may have to do this. But generally, these are viral infections that will respond well without any antibiotics, without any antivirals. All they need is just some drugs that are gonna reduce their fever. What are drugs that reduce fever, guys? NSAIDs, right? Avoid aspirin. Why do you avoid aspirin in viral infections? Because of the risk of? Rye syndrome. So you avoid aspirin, but you can give things like other types of NSAIDs, right? So ibuprofen, uh, ketorolac, you can give naproxen, things like that. Another drug that's preferred really is acetaminophen, okay? So this is kind of like the preferred one. That's your Tylenol. That's the preferred one. But either way, how do these drugs work? Simply put, Virus, we said, triggers these immune system cells. They released all of those cytokines, the interleukin-1, the interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha. That stimulated the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus released some chemicals like PGE2 that reset the body's thermostat and led to a fever. Well, we gotta kinda zoom in on that hypothalamus really quickly and see what happens. You know within the hypothalamus, there's some endothelial cells. So this is kind of like a, this is a part of the hypothalamus, right? It's kind of like the endothelium or like the epithelial cells of the hypothalamus. From here, there's a membrane within the hypothalamus. And what happens is it, bre it breaks down, the membranes break down. And then the lipids are get metabolized by this molecule called phospholipase A2. Phospholipase A2 will break down this into what's called arachidonic acid. And you know arachidonic acid, it uses this enzyme called cyclooxygenase, abbreviated COX, keep your minds clear. This will convert arachidonic acid into what's called prostaglandins. And you know one of the prostaglandins that we talked about was prostaglandin E2. If we give these drugs, NSAIDs, or we give acetaminophen, they inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme. You can't convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. You drop their PGE2 level. Can you trigger a fever now? No, there should be a reduction in the fever. And that is all we need to know about febrile seizures. All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we talk about febrile seizures. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. As always, until next time.